Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. We're on a mission to become Australia's most trusted property podcast. I'm Pete Wargent and I'm joined by top buyers agent, Amy Linardi. Amy, haven't seen you for a little while. How's things? Oh, really good, Pete. Yes, busy down here in Melbourne, but very much looking forward to the summer break coming up because in real estate, we work six, sometimes seven days a week. And we just take the opportunity to take a lot of January off. Most real estate agents do. So I'm very much looking forward to that. How about you? Yeah, you're not wrong. Those weekends can get chewed up very easily in real estate with auctions and inspections and open homes and all the other stuff. And even then on the Sunday, you've got deals you're trying to get across the line. So yeah, look, I've I've been- I've had actually Sunday auctions recently, Pete. I've been buying a lot in the Southeastern suburbs and they do Sunday auctions there. Uh, mm. So, yeah, it's um, it's a big week when that happens. <laughs> Whatever happened to the Sabbath day when we used to get a day off, there's no rest for the weekend, <laughs> as they say. Uh, yeah, not this summer. I've been pretty busy too. Uh, um, Brisbane's been very, very busy actually just over the past few months and I've been travelling around the country a little bit as well. So uh, keeping me out of trouble. So, um, well, thanks everyone for joining today. We always try and answer your questions and be guided by you and usually in the show notes each week you'll find links to the stories we're talking about now this week amy uh, a few people have been asking us about uh, due diligence and uh, not just what it is but also how do you go about performing due diligence on a property um i guess it's been big in the news recently about properties having defects and all kinds of uh, problems that people pick up when they don't do their full due diligence um so well let's crack into it shall we so well, firstly to begin with, or as the first part, let's just talk a bit about what and why. <laughs> so <laughs> firstly, what, you know, how would you actually think of what is due diligence if people aren't familiar? Yeah, well, due diligence, and I think we're, we're going to try and make this episode a little bit more interesting and exciting today with a lot of case studies, because as soon as I use the word due diligence, I it feel sounds like, like everyone's, <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh, everyone's eyes glaze over. They're like, oh my gosh, this sounds so boring because essentially due diligence, it, it can be a bit boring and tedious because it's research. Due diligence is essentially doing all of the checks and balances and research that you need to do before, well, ideally before you buy a property so that you can just understand exactly what you're buying and also any kind of risks involved or future considerations you need to be aware of to make an educated decision on firstly, is that property the right property for you to help you price that property, value that property, discount it at all if you need to, and then assess like its long-term suitability for you, whether that's an investment property or a home to live in. And it is so, 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 so important to do all of the steps in the due diligence process. And quite horrifyingly, I often see or have heard of people who just submit offers or rock up to auctions without having done any due diligence at all. It is scary. I um, Many years ago now, I used to work in corporate finance and uh, when a business uh, sort of uh, acquires another business, they, they go through the same thing, due diligence. And then I guess um, quite often after the event, people pick up uh, problems or issues they hadn't thought about, but it's too late once the transaction's gone through. And it's very similar to the process of buying your house. Once you've settled on the property and you've become the owner, it's too late then to go back and say, well, look, I've found an issue that needs um, repairs or maintenance, or maybe you've bought um, something that, well, it's not what you thought you'd bought. Any kind of issue could come up. So that's why the due diligence is so important. And I guess the cost of getting it wrong is, I mean, it's potentially things like repairs and maintenance, but also what if you get it wrong and, you know, you get no capital growth on the property or worse, a capital loss, 
Um, so it, it could just be a dollar loss, but you could also be stuck with a property you can't sell. So I guess, uh, as you said, I mean, it's absolutely vital that people go about it and do it the right way. Yeah, there's a um, principle in property, which is caveat emptor. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's a Latin word, I guess. Which is, um, <laughs> it's which a few, is... <laughs> few years since I've done Latin, but yeah, I think that's more or less it, isn't it? Which yeah, also applies if... in uh, in financial circles as well, of course. Exactly. And what it means is buyer beware. It's the buyer's responsibility to do all of their research. Yes, there are certain legal requirements which the vendor has to ab- abide by. For example, here in Victoria, there's certain minimum disclosure requirements that you need to provide in the contract in Victoria as well. um, And I don't think there's, they have this in other states. We also have regulations around material facts. In other words, if there's anything which can, um, you know, is significant enough that it would impact the buyer's decision to purchase that property, it needs to be disclosed in the contract. But, and this is things like it could be, you know, a big development going next door, or maybe that property was previously used as a meth lab, or there was a murder there, or something that, you know, could potentially impact that buyer's decision to buy it or value of that property. It should be in the contract. But, but the reality is, is I've seen many situations where things haven't been disclosed, whether that's the vendor trying to purposely hide things or unintentionally hide things, or the agent or, um, and it just, it's its so much, yes, you might have legal rights later down the track to pursue that person, but it's once you bought the property, it's so much harder to do that. It's just better to know up front to be able to make educated decisions. I think that's right. So, I mean, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. I think um, we've touched on this in a podcast episode before, Amy, where, uh, you know, sometimes people, they think of, you know, the real estate agent as their best buddy in the process. But don't forget the vendor is going to be looking to sell the property for as much as possible, the highest price they can get and on the best terms and conditions possible. And the real estate agent, in the end, their job is to make a transaction happen. So even though um, there's a, a material disclosure requirement, uh, don't assume that um, everything's going to be disclosed in your best interest, hence the uh, the buyer beware um, sort of a slogan that we that we talk about, caveat emptor. And I guess when you're buying a property, there's always going to be an information asymmetry. In other words, the vendor's going to know a heck of a lot more about the uh, the details of the property and all the little bits and pieces that might need fixing or even major issues. That as the buyer, you know, you're just not going to have the same level of transparency. Um, hence the importance of the the, the DD process, I guess. So we've got a couple of different uh, categories and case studies to have a chat about just to highlight why you really need to do your due diligence. Um, And I've tried to have a think about more unusual situations that I've come across Um, because, yes, you know, doing a building inspection and finding issues here and there or doing a contract review and maybe having to change a few conditions, et cetera, that's very common. That's pretty standard. Um, But I have, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years and I've been involved in probably over 1,500 transactions now. Sometimes I come across things where I say, hmm, this is new, this is different, and it involves just further research and further investigation. Um, But sometimes it uncovers things which are either deal breakers or things that we definitely need to factor into the price of that property. So to begin with, building inspections. Now, pretty much all building inspections that we get have some kind of defects. And you really need to then, we, we did a whole episode on building inspections, but you really need to then assess or figure out like the magnitude of those defects. And sometimes you need to then get further specialists, which is why leaving a building inspection until the last minute can be a little bit risky. I've had a couple of um, examples just this year, for example, when the building inspector has highlighted that that property has structural potential structural problems and in which case we've actually gone and got a structural engineer to come out now that sounds really expensive doesn't it but for some reason in my mind I just always used to think oh structural engineers that sounds expensive but the ones that we found and we use they're about the same price as a building inspection and in one situation we had that structural engineer come out and he said 
I cannot even comment on how serious this is because this is this this needs so much more investigation. There are so many red flags here. This property looks like it it was on um a big slope. It had all of these foundations that seem to have built been built by, you know, a DIY person back in the 70s and it was an absolute deal breaker. But then in other situations the building inspector has been a little bit concerned. We've got a structural engineer out and they've said no, this is actually totally fine. It's something that you can keep an eye on or it's something that's not getting any worse. But it's actually been beneficial because what the building inspector has deemed as a major defect, we've gotten further advice to say it's actually not. Because just remember, a building inspector is a generalist and they can identify certain issues which they think is a problem. But sometimes you get an electrician out or a plumber out or a structural engineer out to confirm if that's an issue or not to help you make that final educated decision. You made a really good point there. Uh, in the financial world, uh, where I've seen the due diligence process fall over or fall short sometimes is when everything's done in a mad rush towards a specific deadline. And uh, it can be a bit the same if you've got an auction coming up for a property and you're trying to get everything done at the last minute, that's when stuff can get missed. You know, If you're reading reports in a hurry or if you don't have time to follow up on potential issues and do further investigations so as you said try and get these things done with a bit of time to spare because if you try and do everything last minute that's going to increase the risk i guess of something important being missed now i mean we said we we're going to do some case studies today i'm yeah. going to have to call out this one first uh, just because it sounds so interesting tell us about the moldy house it sounds the moldy house <laughs> yeah is it, it sounds like some kind of landmark case you've got here so <laughs> Please enlighten. It's not actually that exciting. It was <laughs> we we were looking at at, at purchasing a property, um, and it was a it was a timber frame property as a townhouse, and it had render on the outside. And our building inspector identified that all throughout that living space there was moisture at the bottom the bottom of those walls. And you know when when we're looking at really old period brick properties. Moisture is quite common. There's often a little bit of dampness in those walls. You know, bricks are porous. They don't often have damp proof courses from back in those days. So, you know, in those cases, we generally, you know, assess the severity of it, of course, and make a decision. But when it came to this property, you know, it was 10 years old. It was timber frame. It just, there was no reason why there should have been dampness along there. So that was a really... Um, that was a case where we would just had to have really in-depth conversations with that building inspector. He said, look, there's no weep holes here. That could be what caused the problem. There's some garden beds here, et cetera. So in that instance, we had to really talk through worst case scenarios. And that's what I always suggest doing when you get a building inspection and there's a problem. You say to the building inspector, what's the worst case scenario here that could happen? And he said, look, the worst case could be that there, there's mold all throughout that wall all throughout the living room walls because the, the vendor had recently painted that property so we couldn't actually see what was going on and there were a few bits and pieces which I just I felt a bit uncomfortable about it the agent was being a bit evasive the vendor wasn't really answering questions and I just feel really felt really uncomfortable about the whole situation to the point where I did some digging and I had a look through really old um, history of that property and noticed a property manager that I knew was man had managed that property about three or four years ago. And I gave her a call and I said, mm, do you, you know, have any memory of this property? And without me prompting her, she told me that that house had been full of mould. So it confirmed my suspicions. That was just such an unusual case of me having a bit of a stroke of luck to, to find that out. Um, but it just solidified our decision to say, no, this is not a house we're willing to take on because mould in timber, yes, technically you can rectify it, but it can be really, really hard, really expensive, can come back. It can be, it, it was just a complete red flag for us. This is a, an important principle you've raised there. What is the worst case scenario? Uh, if you're going to do a due diligence, you need to think, Okay, all right. I've identified a potential issue here, but what if it's you know what is the worst thing that could happen? Because uh, it's a bit like the old rule of engineering, you know, over a long enough timeline, if something can go wrong, it probably will. So it's really worth considering um, what the worst case scenario might be. I think in Queensland, we often 
have issues with um, the pest inspections where you're looking for signs of live termite activity, but there might be a part of the property that's just not accessible if you've got certain floorboards that have been laid and you can't get under them. And, and then you've got to think, right, okay, well, you know, best case scenario, there's no issue, but what's the worst case here? You know, we, we're not actually doing a full inspection. Um, so, yes, you mentioned their townhouse uh, properties, Amy, and um, on the similar theme of worst case scenarios, we actually bought one once um, some years ago in New Farm in Brisbane. And um, there was an issue that came to light from the building inspection where the firewall between two townhouses wasn't fully complete. And this is the sort of thing where you really need to firstly understand, well, who's at, whose liability is it or whose responsibility is it to get this firewall finished? And uh, it's a really good example of worst case scenario. What if there's a fire and, you know, you, you actually are aware of there having been a defect or an issue? And then, you know, there's, you know, I mean, imagine the, the potential outcomes there it could be catastrophic. So, you know, that's uh, just a, a simple example of uh, where the due diligence uncovered um, very potentially very significant issues. Um, so, and I think with Pete coming back to that worst case scenario thing, if you if you take that approach to every property and every aspect of your life, you're not going to ever make any decisions, right? <laughs> so, because mm, always the worst case scenario is, is you know, it's it could be quite scary. Um, but then you've just got to assess the probability of it. So a combination of what's worst case scenario, what's the probability of that happening? Um, and in which case, if that happened, could I deal with it? Could I rectify it? Do I have the cash to cover it? You know, worst case scenario, because you know, for example, we talk about bank valuation shortfalls sometimes when you buy a property and you get your finance, technically there's a risk the valuation could come in short. It almost never happens in my experience, especially because I'm very thorough. But I say to my clients, worst case scenario, if it happened, what would you do? Do you have a bit of extra cash? Can you borrow some more? You've got friends and family. That's what we focus on. So it's a combination of what could happen, the risk of it happening, and what you would do. Because otherwise, if you always just focused on it, you'd never make any decisions. So I just do want to put that into perspective as well. Yeah, no, it's a good point. In fact, it happened to me. We, uh, you know, we were in 2009 when um, global sentiment, as you may remember, in early 2009 was probably the worst I can ever remember, uh, certainly in modern history. And we, you know, we decided to take the plunge on um, a brand new property that it was already heavily discounted, but the bank bell came in even lower than our offer. And it's like, but we thought about this, you know, worst case, we have to kick in an extra bit of deposit. You know, it's, it's a, you know, you, you know, there's a potential for it to happen, but what's the worst case? And if you can deal with the worst case, then fair enough, I guess. And as you say, you also need to, yeah, it's almost like a Bayesian analysis, you know, uh, you need to take into account the probability of these things as well. So, uh, yes, owners, corporations, um, and whose responsibility things like defects might be. That's an interesting one. And I guess a review of things like uh, body corporate or strata minutes can always reveal some interesting scenarios. If you had any, um, uh, sort of uh, interesting case studies in, in that regard. We've often seen things <laughs> yeah. like noise complaints or, God, well, there's been some really bad ones, I guess, in terms of uh, general behaviour in some blocks of units. But uh, anything that's come up uh, when you've done a purchase? Yeah, so owners' corporations, that's what we call it here in Victoria, but in other states they call it body corporates. And this is, it's just so important to do your due diligence around this. Um, and that is, you know, here in Victoria we have owners corporation certificates and minutes, which are included in the contract. Uh, but we always, Steph and I in my office, we always then follow up the owners corporation manager to get more information. So we are, uh, we're first of all, clarifying anything in the minutes that, you know, for example, if there's upcoming maintenance or historical issues in the block that's been mentioned or potential special levies. But then we also say, you know, has there been any historical issues with the block we have to be aware of? Any previous discussions that weren't in this meeting, but maybe they were in previous meetings talking about plans for the future that could cost money um, or, you know, any disputes, just anything extra that we need to be aware of. And I always want to get this from the owner's corporation, not from the agent and not from the vendor. You cannot rely on what they say. They could be the most honest people going around, but you cannot rely on what they say. It has to come direct from the source. And through these discussions with owners' corporations, and I'm going to like put a little asterisk here because I know that in some other states, for example, in New South Wales and in Sydney, 
it's not common to speak to the body corporate. You get a strata searcher. This is my understanding, Pete. You get a strata searcher and they do all the research for you and they kind of give you that information. Um, but, you know, if it's a possibility for you to do, this is a really important extra step. I had a really interesting situation recently where I was reading through the OC minutes and I did briefly speak to that owner's corporation manager, but they were being very PC. They were being very high level. They weren't giving me the information that I really wanted. But in the minutes, it was talking about a really active committee that that owner's corporation had. A committee is like a subgroup of owners in that block and they're the ones that do all the day-to-day stuff and they're often really passionate about that property and they just know everything. They're like the local block gossip people as well. (laughs) So I managed to get the committee um, chairperson's phone number, gave them a call, spoke to them for like 40 minutes and through that phone call, I actually discovered that within that owner's corporation, there was a $25,000 insurance premium for any water claims in that block. So what that meant is just say your dishwasher flooded, Pete, and your dishwasher flooded your whole apartment and it flooded the apartment below and there was all this damage because you were away for the weekend and you didn't know. That premium, if it cost you less to fix, you know, you'd just pay it yourself, but just say that costs like 50 grand to fix everything, you'd be up for a 25 grand premium. That is really, really, really high. And the reason behind that is because that block had previously had a lot of water claims. So the insurer had put the premium up. So that's just a really important piece of information that I discovered just through talking to people, talking, talking, talking. And for us, that was actually a deal breaker. That was just not a risk we were happy to take on. I have this problem every time I hire a car, I always have this concern about the excess and it's like, what's the probability of me having a prang and I'm usually like, just pay the extra because <laughs> it would be sod's law, you know, the first time you don't pay it, uh, you end up involved in being broadsided or something. And yeah, it's the same when it comes to insuring properties, right? You need to consider you know, well, how much might you be up for there? And uh, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, it's interesting actually because a lot of um, committees – you know, just run by lay people, not necessarily specialists in the industry, but they've often got a vested interest in the upkeep of the block. And if you can speak to them, uh, people love to talk about their own property. <laughs> so you see, you can get some good information. As you said, in Queensland, we'd normally just get a, a specialist uh, to review the strata and the minutes and all that stuff for you. It comes at a small cost, but it's, um, it's worth every cent because um, the potential issues you could pick up uh, with an owner's corp or a body corporate um, well, they could be limitless. And as you mentioned, you know, potential for things like special levies or repairs or, you know, disputes in the block. Um, so definitely. Yeah. Um, Another one recently, is- actually, I had Pete was when we were talking to an owner's corporation because they'd recently done quite a bit of works to that property, stormwater works, et cetera. Oh, sorry, window works. And that, that had all been paid for, which is great. But through our conversations with them and said, you know, is there any plans for big upcoming works in the future and they said yeah we're probably going to need to replace all of the drainage in this whole block and fix all of the concrete and that's going to need to be done maybe in the next couple of years this wasn't mentioned in the minutes this was just discussions that had been held years and years ago but we're starting to get to the point where it needed to be done and that could have ended up being you know potentially hundreds of thousand dollars split between 20-ish apartments, so a a big special levy coming up. So just all of these extra things which you can uncover through conversations um, or at least just whether it's not speaking to them, sending the agent an email saying, please get the body corporate to answer this for me if possible, if this is a thing that happens in your state and just try and get the answers that way. And when you're looking at a property with a body corporate or an OC, do this straight away because it can take them a while to get back to you. I reckon like 10% of our day is chasing body corporates to get answers to things. <laughs> yes, yeah, so one of the downsides of the the role, I guess, is uh, chasing up those bits of admin. So, Amy, through our uh, case studies here, we've, or your case studies mainly, we've covered off so far uh, building inspections, things like pest and termite inspections, structural issues potentially if that comes up or is relevant, and also owners corporations or body corporate. Uh, now, obviously, another important part of the due diligence is a review of the actual contract for the property you're buying. So most people will use a solicitor or conveyancer who's licensed in the state or territory that they're buying in. 
Um, so what might come up in a contract review that might be of uh, importance for a due diligence? Yeah, so I want to highlight the importance here of not only getting a contract review, but remembering that your legal representative has not looked at that property. They haven't walked through that property. They might check the link online. Some conveyances do, some don't. Uh, and they don't know what the agent's been telling you. So you need to remember that you are that middle person or the conduit between your legal rep and, you know, the purchase of that property. You need to share extra information. So, you know, for example, I had a recent uh, contract where they sent it through. The auction was in a couple of days. It came through really late. And I had to scan through it straight away because I always do. And straight off the bat, I noticed that the car space title was missing from that contract. So I knew there was a car space supposed to come with that property. But if that conveyancer did a contract review, they wouldn't necessarily know that there was supposed to be a car space. So if I hadn't have picked that up, then perhaps it would have gone completely unmissed. And if you then had bought that property and the title of the car space was missing, in the conveyance's words, it would have been a nightmare to deal with later on to then get that car space title transferred to you. It's funny how that comes up. I've seen it in Sydney as well, whereby um, you know people are looking at uh, maybe a rental property and they say, I'm sure there's supposed to be a car space with this property, but we can't track it down and the records are old and you know, the unit numbers don't line up with the car space numbers. And it's like, well, you know, these are the things that if you don't get it right the first time, then going back and trying to rectify could be uh, painful or even not possible. So uh, it's a good example of um, where you need to be thorough on the contract review. Um, so what else does a solicitor and conveyancer look at? Things like inclusions, I guess, are important. Um, in Queensland, we're quite lucky now because the contract's are generally standardized under REIQ. In some other parts of the country, you get these big, thick, chunky contracts with lots of addendums and bits and pieces at the back, which is quite a bit of painful work for, I guess, for the solicitor um, and particularly for you know everyday people because they don't see these things day in, day out. So I guess that's where getting a professional to run through it all is so important. Yeah. And another example of where you need to be a little bit, you know, proactive in your role is the solicitor or conveyancer might highlight the zoning of that property. And I had a, you know, I've had many situations where the zoning has been non-residential. So for example, we've looked at an apartment a few weeks ago, which was commercially zoned because it was an old converted pub. It was really cool actually. And I then had, I then said to the broker, this zoning is resident, sorry, this zoning is commercial. Will this lender accept that at the client's LVR, the client's deposit that they have. So they had to go through the process of then getting, you know, checking approval with the lender to say, yes, well, she's got an X deposit and this is okay within our policy or we're not sure we've got to refer this on or, you know, this is the worst case scenario. Um, and I've had previous scenarios where they've said, okay, worst case, they're going to have to contribute a 30% deposit if it's commercially zoned. And not everyone can do that, Pete. You might have had just a 10% deposit. So what what would have happened if you bought that property and um, and all of a sudden you had to come up with an extra deposit? And that's a really important case study because the conveyancer highlighted it, but if you then hadn't gone and told your broker about it, they wouldn't know that. They're not checking the zoning of a property when you're going to bid at an auction or put an offer in. So you need to be the one in the middle letting everyone know. It's a good point. And actually, you reminded me during the Banking Royal Commission, these are the sorts of things that were coming up. The, the lenders were so twitchy about everything um, that we even had um, uh, sort of blocks of units that uh, were coming up for sale. And um, yeah, the, the lending terms were totally different from what you'd normally expect. And they were being addressed on a commercial basis. But yeah, if this zoning is literally commercial, um, well, yeah, there's potential headaches there in terms of financing. And even down the track, when you come to sell, potentially, you know, the next buyer is going to take a look at it and say, well, this is, you know, it's non-standard. You know, you need to understand, you know, what you're buying, I guess. And as long as you're, you know, comfortable and you've done the full due diligence and you're sure you can finance it, then it may all be okay. But it's uh, being, I guess, aware of those potential issues. And another thing, Pete, that I do always as um, 
like pretty much straight away when I'm looking at a property, I use this amazing website. I'm going to share my secret here because it's just my favorite website in the world. It's called Land Checker. Give them a free plug. There's a basic free um, account that you can sign up for. You can get the premium account, which I recommend doing whilst you're in the market for a property. And it gives you so much information. So, you know, it shows you satellite images of, you know, you can look back 10 years ago and you can see the title boundaries and planning permits in the area. So I'll always jump on to Land Checker and have a look at the title boundaries and, you know, what's happening in that vicinity. I had this really interesting scenario recently and this was one of the one of the situations where I was like, oh, this is unusual. I've never seen this before where I noticed that um, within the contract and within the Land Checker boundaries, um, the boundaries showed that it was our property plus a little, um, not little, maybe 30 square metres of the neighbour's yard. And in all of the certificates and everything, it showed that chunk of land in our property, but it wasn't. And I, um, the way that I realised and well, I knew it wasn't is the title. The title is the be all end all. That's what you check to understand, you know, the size of um, and the shape of that block. And what had happened, curiously, is that at some point down the track, that parcel of land behind had been bought by the neighbour, but allocated to our property. So that vendor for our property had been paying rates, council rates, on that block of land for like 10 years and not even realising. So it's just a bit of a weird administration thing. It was an easy fix. It was a matter of proving that you weren't the owner and going through council and they would have fixed it all. But it was just a really bizarre situation and just one that, you know, ideally you pick up now, otherwise it can cost you down the track. So you doing by you doing that extra bit of due diligence with that land checker and just checking the title and checking the shape of the land and everything, um, really, really important. It goes back to that point. How do you know you're buying what you think you're buying? And yes, titles and contract reviews, absolutely critical part of that. And a really good example, a real life case study there. So Amy, one of the things that seems to come up in Queensland all the time is certification or probably more accurately the lack of certification so we often see things like extensions put on properties or carports or plumbing works and it's quite often we see that um the work has been applied for and approved but then for whatever reason people forget to get the inspectors out to get the certificates closed off and it seems to come up very very regularly uh, and sometimes even for quite old properties as well there's just no uh, sort of record of certification or building permits. Um, uh, is that something you grapple with in Victoria as well? Oh my gosh, so much. <laughs> it happens all the time. It's a very Aussie and, thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh yeah, I know I'm supposed to probably get this permit, but I'm not going to do it. Um, or sometimes people just don't know. So that's why they don't do it. But there's a scale. There's a scale of severity here, Pete. For example, if someone hasn't got a planning and a building permit for a full extension that they've done on a brand new renovated home, that's a big red flag. But, you know, if they haven't gone and gotten a permit from a deck that was built 15 years ago, probably less of an issue. And this is where you need to weigh up the the risks and the probability of it being a problem and figure out, okay, well, worst case scenario, first of all, that deck's been there for 15 years. It's probably not going to be a problem. What are my risks involved? And worst case scenario, if I had to get rid of the deck or fix it or, you know, get a certification on it, that's probably what you could do versus a house which has had no planning and building permits at all. That's not a risk that I would ever take on. But yes, I would say very more common than not that people don't get permits, especially for the smaller things. Yeah, and I think uh, we'd see all the time in Brisbane, you know, someone's you know got some approval for I don't know some plumbing or you know some kind of. A relatively sort of minor piece of work and they it hasn't been closed off so you've got an open certificate well that, that's quite often a thing that can be fixed prior to settlement if it's a if it's not a major issue and as you said you've got to also think about the balance of probabilities and well what's the worst case here um yeah so in, in the case of a, a major extension and if that's not certified that, that could be a different uh, problem altogether um so yeah an important one to cover off i guess um sort of related to the point on contract review. Uh, so we talked a little bit about titles, uh, car spaces not being allocated properly. Um, I think something that does pop up quite a bit 
in properties, things like easements. Um, so and there's different types of easements where, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the council might have access if you've got a drain that runs along the back of your property. But in some more extreme cases, sometimes people even might have access to your property or a right of way potentially. Yeah, I had this one many years ago where uh, the easement allowed access for the neighbour to essentially walk through your backyard to get to their like back gate. They could get through their property other ways. It was just a really old easement. And for my clients, like for me, if I was buying that property, I actually wouldn't have been a deal breaker because I would have thought, okay, well, you know, I don't want them walking through my yard, but they probably don't want to be walking through my yard as well. <laughs> like The chances of them doing that are pretty low. But for this client that I was acting for, they were like, you know what, this is just not going to work for me. I feel a bit uncomfortable about it. But it's important that you were aware of that. And that's what the, the, leg, um, the legal review identified. Whereas other easements um, can be just for, say, you know, the water authority accessing your land if there's a blockage in the pipe and they have to get under there. But it's just important to know about things like easements because just say that person has built an illegal extension over an easement, even bigger of a risk because, you know, you're not supposed to do that. Um, if I see something like a deck over an easement, again, I'm like, okay, well, I can probably forgive that. But if it's a big permanent structure where if you have to take that down, it's going to cost you a lot, going to really impact your amenity, then that can potentially be or most likely going to be a deal breaker. It's a good point. And sometimes you see uh, as well shared driveway access if you've got a property that's just, you know, not just a plain vanilla uh, layout. Sometimes um, you might have something whereby, you know, more than one person has access to a driveway, which is not ideal, but it's not always a deal breaker. I suppose it depends on circumstances and the, the situation. Ideally, of course, you don't have any easements at all, but sometimes... It is something that comes up. Um, Amy, what about um, future issues? So sometimes people say to me, you know, they want to come on board and use our buyer's agency service, but they say, look, I don't want to buy somewhere and then find out in the future someone's going to drive a motorway right next door or, you know, maybe a future, you know, transport project. Um, I mean, there's some really good stuff you can do these days in terms of searching for nearby development approvals, which I think is an important part of your due diligence if there's going to be you know apartment projects built nearby or maybe even um you know just next door to your property someone's going to be doing a, a renovation or uh, maybe a, a rebuild you want to know about this stuff um so uh, uh, doing a search for nearby da's is an important part of the due diligence but um yeah i think uh, as well you know, we've sometimes seen um if you're buying property that's close to public or social housing um, you know, that's something you need to factor in as well, because, you know, at some point, a lot of these properties are very old, they're going to need redeveloping. And I'm sure I was reading this week that uh, Melbourne's population has grown by 1.7 million since the 2001 census. So this stuff is happening all the time in Melbourne. So I'm sure it's something you've seen a lot of down there. Yeah, absolutely. And there are ways to understand any kind of planning permits that, or DAs, as they call them interstate, um, which are happening in the area through tools like Land Checker. I think it's just in the premium um, subscription though, by the way. But then also just calling council, speaking to the planning department and say, hey, just wondering if there's any pending or approved planning permits in the direct vicinity that could affect me. Bearing in mind there is a difference between a, something that needs a planning permit versus a building permit. Building permits aren't in Victoria at least, registered with council when they're doing it. So if someone's just doing a renovation next door, that's not necessarily going to be brought up. But is that really a problem for you? Um, probably not. But if it is a subdivision or a big apartment block or whatever, then, yeah, absolutely, you'd want to know about it. But also bearing in mind that those applications in the, the council system, they're only things that are currently there. They're not going to suggest what could be there in the future. So then if I'm ever looking at a property and there's big blocks around our property or um, if, you know, there's a residential growth zone nearby or if there is like a really old dilapidated house nearby, well, then, of course, it's going to be a greater risk for redevelopment. So then you can look further into saying, okay, well, you know, what is the maximum height limit that could go here? Speaking to council, reading the zoning and overlays on the council website, all of these things I recommend doing. Yes, it's a lot of 
extra effort. But if you're sensitive to development, you want to know. We also use tools like um, the Big Build website, you know, Vic Roads, just to have an understanding of what's happening in those areas. Um, we have an understanding of, you know, where the, where the big major infrastructure projects are happening. We've got the Northeast Link going on right now here in Victoria. So that impacts certain areas in the Northeastern suburbs. So all of these things you absolutely should look into if you're buying a property for the long term. Social housing redevelopments, those are things which are a little bit less accessible to get information of. On, I find the government is sometimes not like overly forthcoming with that information, but the stuff that's already been decided on is available. You can just, you know, Google the area, speak to council. It's more of a state government thing though than a local council thing. Um, but sometimes it can also be mentioned, we, we're looking at one actually this week, where um, there's no planning applications in the system, but in the body corporate minutes, it talks about how there's a potential redevelopment for social housing happening literally out the front of our property um, and how the owners corporation has been um, working with council and working with neighbours to, you know, to workshop that and, and um, potentially um, understand the impacts of it. So all very, very relevant, all things that um, you need to put a little bit of extra effort into. And these things are free to do, by the way. It doesn't cost you anything to do these things. So as soon as you're interested in a property, sit on the couch, jump behind your laptop, call a council, do it straight away. Because if there's any red flags, better to know now, then you know, invest your time and effort and building inspection money and then realise later on or worse after you buy that property. 100%. Yeah. So, Amy, <laughs> I, I get the sense that uh, the list of case studies could um, be uh, almost limitless, I suppose, of all the different things that could happen. But uh, that should give us a good, I guess, a good flavour of the potential risks and um, how to mitigate them. So, I guess to bring it all together for today, I guess you could almost summarise a lot of this, um, the due diligence process under the heading, what could possibly go wrong so i mean how do we how do we make sure we don't get caught let's out that, or... let's that's that's the title of the episode pete you've nailed it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the, uh, i'm often asked them um, to come up with headlines or episode titles so there you go so it's come to us uh, like a flash Organic of inspiration thing, yeah. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong yeah so i guess in terms of um due diligence processes yes caveat emptor let the buyer beware i think as well the old motto act in haste repent at leisure or whatever our uh, parents used to say uh, back in the day. I oh, think I've never heard that saying before, <laughs> Pete. <laughs> there's something in that. Um, I'm sure that's the phrase, but it's basically, yes, you, you don't want to rush the due diligence process at the last minute, ideally, because that's when things can get missed or if you're under pressure to meet a deadline. So make sure you do it up front. Create a template. Create a template, Pete. This is what we have. So I've got my spreadsheet in front of me right now. It's called my offer prep spreadsheet for every client, for every property we go for. I have a checklist of everything that we need to check beforehand. So depending on which state you're in, you can create your own checklist so that you can tick those things off for every property you're interested in so that you know you haven't missed anything. If you're in Victoria, feel free to do my online course, which tells you every single thing you need to know about the due diligence process. Or if you're interstate, figure it out, research it, like ask people, talk to people and, and say like, what are the steps? I need to know the steps. So you can create a spreadsheet so you don't miss anything. That's perfect. You can't go wrong with a checklist. Um, yes, the the old auditor in me would say. So uh, mm -hmm. make sure you cover off all those different areas. Um, so, Amy, thanks uh, so much for your insights um, today. Uh, so if people wanted to um, get in contact uh, with you, where should they go to for more? Yeah, so I'm at amylenardi.com.au. That is my Melbourne-based buyers advocacy business and I've also got the first home guidebook.com.au which is a online course for Victorian home buyers how about you Pete where can we find you that's perfect yes do send in your questions by the way because uh, we love to try and cover off whatever's hot and uh, whatever's topical and yes if you want to catch me Pete Wardgen blogspot is my daily blog or at Pete Wardgen on Twitter and um, yeah we're mainly active in the Brisbane property market and as well a bit in Newcastle and Central Coast in New South Wales. So uh, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks again, Amy, and uh, look forward to chatting next time. Thanks, Pete. See ya. Cheers.